how can we be as a space making content on other platforms that is reaching new audiences instead of just kind of waiting for everyone to come to us on crypto Twitter, right? And so that's kind of why I'm pretty passionate about making content on other platforms like Instagram, like even Pinterest. And, you know, I hate to say TikTok, but, um, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I'm there as well. Um, because I think that putting this content in front of them where they're already hanging out is, is a really valuable thing versus just saying, oh, hey, we're on YouTube and Twitter. You can come check us out here. Dear crypto community and blockchain buddies across the globe, welcome back to Kryptonites, the no BS blockchain channel built with the community and for the community. And today we have another cool, geeky, fun guest to discuss many hot topics such as crypto portfolio diversification, crypto assets versus stocks, and her favorite coins and tokens. Without further ado, Leah Thompson, aka Girl Gone Crypto. It's an absolute pleasure to have you today, Leah. How are you doing? Thank you so much for having me on the show. I'm super stoked to be here. I love what you guys are doing. So I'm excited just to be here and get to hang out with you guys. I'm so excited as well. Seriously, your content is a breath of fresh air. It's so light. The Harry Potter joke with the Fed being Voldemort was hilarious. The Fed, which we will affectionately refer to in this video as Voldemort, is out of control with printing money and putting us deeper and deeper in debt. Thank you. I, I had a lot of fun making that one. And uh, it's kind of nice to let like my nerd side out a little bit. So, yeah. <laughs> well, guess what? We really need some geeky and nerdy stuff out there just to make things a bit more fun. But first and foremost, I'd love to ask you about your personal story. You know, what took your heart? Did you have any breakthroughs? Why did you decide to be a part of this decentralized movement and be one of these Bitcoin believers? Yeah, so I would say that my kind of rabbit hole story, if you will, um, dates back to being a campaign manager for a state house race here in the US, uh, I don't know, a long time ago, I think in 2008 or 2010. And um, at that point, I... You know, I heard some stuff about the Fed and about, you know, libertarians and, you know, anarchists. And I kind of heard about that, but I didn't really know what it was about. And then as I got deeper and deeper into my local party and the state level, um, I started to see a lot of the hypocrisy of the two-party system and some of the the issues and the things that they were saying the other side was doing to play dirty, I realized once I got deeper into these like kind of more inner circle conversations that they were using the exact same tactics and it just felt so hypocritical and it really caused me to start to go down the path of realizing just what a sham our two-party system is um, here in the U.S. and just really start to research more and learn more. And I started to align more with the libertarians and realizing that that philosophy actually lined up with my personal values more. And Bitcoin and crypto just fits into my whole world philosophy so much in terms of self-sovereignty, personal freedom, personal responsibility. And so when I found crypto, it just was really the it just makes a lot of sense. And it's it's a tool that I think we can use to help get closer to the type of world and the type of society that I would actually want to live in. Yeah, absolutely. So those principles and values is very often what resonates to most people out there. But I'd love to ask you, who are some of the crypto educators that you really like to follow in order to get access to quality content? Oh, yeah. So... You know, obviously there's like some of the big names that I have loved getting to learn from on YouTube, you know, like Andreas Antonopoulos and people like that. But in terms of like people that really inspired me to want to start making more content and do some more education, uh, Naomi Brockwell was actually someone that I, I really looked up to and was like, and still do, of course, you know, but just as someone that I'm like, wow, I love what she does. I love the energy she brings, the way she breaks things down. And so I wanted to bring some of that energy and that type of approach to my own content because I do think there's a lot of just really like heavily 
technical content in the space that can feel a little overwhelming to newcomers. And so I always try to bring that newcomer perspective into the work that I do. Even if I'm not doing total 101 content, like even if I'm just interviewing someone from a project, I always try to keep that mindset of, you know, what questions would I, would like, you know, me two, three years ago would have had, like, what would those be? And bring those into the conversation so that it actually feels more approachable to people that are getting into the space. Yeah, it's definitely more approachable. Seriously, it's really, really fun. And, you know, recently speaking of like content, so I heard that there was a huge ban on Instagram kind of affecting crypto female influencers, including yourself. I'd love to ask uh, with regards to censorship resistance and Bitcoin as a whole, is censorship resistance because of those things that are, you know, kind of impacting people like yourself, one of the features that you like the most currently about Bitcoin? That's a good question. So for the Instagram thing sp specifically, that wasn't really about censorship. Um, what happened was that there was a targeted attack. So I guess in a way that is censorship, but it wasn't Instagram, the platform taking us down. It was someone mass paying to have some bots mass report a few of us. And so, you know, that that's a little bit different. But Censorship is definitely a huge issue in our world right now. I mean, we're seeing it, especially on YouTube, with crypto content being taken down. We're seeing it on Facebook a lot. And so I'm a really big fan of a lot of these kind of decentralized alternative platforms for that reason, where you actually do have ownership of your content. But in terms of Bitcoin itself being censorship resistant, like that just really ties back to what we were just talking about, you know, with self-sovereignty and being able to have control over your own life and one of the biggest parts of your life is your money and being able to actually have you know more control over what happens and like to me like you know you think about I've got, you know, maybe some different stock accounts and things like that if something happened to that platform to you know like E-Trade or whatever it, there's not a whole lot that I can necessarily do about it, but I can protect my private keys for my Bitcoin. And so I feel so much more secure with having that kind of level of control over my own personal finances. Awesome. So it's not just sensor resistance, it's control, self sovereignty, and just mm -hmm. having that personal freedom that you were talking about earlier. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Yeah. Awesome. You just talked about stocks, which is very interesting. It's a perfect segue. Thank you so much for that, Leah. Um, so a lot of people now are wondering, is it really worth investing in stocks uh, just because the crypto sphere, you know, compared to 2017 is actually de delivering real technology with real products, with real value, right? Mm -hmm. So at the moment, what is your portfolio looking like? You don't have to tell us all about it, but do you still have interest in stocks? Or are you mainly focused on crypto as a new asset class? So my portfolio is very heavily crypto, um, but I do have some diversification with some stocks. You know, I think that it's not necessarily, you know, a bad idea. Like if you bought Tesla stock at the beginning of this year, you'd yeah. be pretty happy right now. <laughs> you know? You'd be going to Mars with Elon, right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> And so I think for me, some of the diversification is maybe just some rollover from 401ks I had at like previous jobs that, you know, that I've kind of just kept there. Or maybe I've made some more like targeted decisions for specific stocks that are with companies that I maybe believe in, that I want to support, that I think has a trajectory that's moving forward. But for the most part, I am quite heavily invested in crypto. And within that subsection, actually a large percentage of my portfolio is Bitcoin specifically. So I've kind of shifted my my mindset um, with how I choose what to invest in over the last few years. So um, when I first started uh, in the crypto space about three years ago, I was really interested in altcoins, which is interesting because I think CoinMarketCap recently put out a, um, a research paper that basically showed that the majority of people buy Bitcoin first and then they get into alts. And I was kind of the opposite because, I mean, it was like a big ICO pump. All this stuff was happening. And I was like, "Ooh, Bitcoin's cool, but these are fun. Like, you know, what's going <laughs> to happen next? Just kind of just like more exciting. And then I got really wrecked <laughs> in 2018 when it all came crashing down. And it, it really caused me to have a little different perspective of, okay, I need to be more strategic with the altcoins I decide to invest in. I need to actually understand their value proposition. They need to be someone that I'm willing to, you know, follow re pretty regularly, like on Twitter to see what is happening in development to make sure that it's still kind of on track for the value proposition I thought they'd be providing. Like, so I've kind of narrowed the, the, bucket, if you will, to 
have fewer but more targeted and specific uh, choices with who and where I invest. Leah, you are perfect. You're transitioning every single question for me. I don't need a segue. <laughs> Um, yeah, that's great. And, and I love what you, you're saying about having the majority or your, your bag mostly into Bitcoin. And it's funny because a lot of, you know, maxis, even nowadays, some of the hardcore maxis are saying, you know, 90% Bitcoin, 10% I play with other altcoins. Uh, but yeah. it's, that's a really, really good point. But you mentioned something related to value. And that is really mm -hmm. important because, you know, when the market during this 2017, 2018 kind of, you know, craze where a lot of us got wrecked. But to me personally, <laughs> my best lessons learned was thanks to being wrecked. So I really take that as an opportunity mm -hmm. and, and learn and, and be able to improve myself. But in terms of the actual value, how can you value things these days? What are some of the criteria that you just mentioned Twitter, looking at their activity on Twitter? Are there any other things, Leah, that you really that really matter to you when looking at coins and tokens? Yeah, so from just kind of like a base level of research, you know, really looking at what are they building, what problem are they solving in the market, and is it actually better than what other people are trying to do, right? So there's a lot of people that, you know, have, there's a lot of different blockchains where you can build dApps on it, for example. Um, you know, why is Ethereum versus EOS versus, you know, whatever other <laughs> blockchains, um, you know, how are they different and what's the value proposition and which ones do I think are likely to be uh, more successful in the long run will determine kind of how much of a percentage of my portfolio I might give them. And so really looking at what they're actually doing uh, and then also looking at are they fulfilling their promises. A lot of people can talk a big talk, but what's actually being built? What's the actual timeline? And, and so that's where I kind of say like staying in tune with a project I think is really important because I can make an initial investment decision, you know, maybe from a year or two ago, but if I haven't really stayed up on it, you know, then how do I know if that's still a good value proposition? How do I know if that's still a good investment? And so that's where I think that having fewer bags, but actually, you know, having them in things that I don't mind spending the time staying up on is, is important for me. I love that. So you look at kind of competitive positioning, you look at how big is the problem they're solving. Uh, these mm -hmm. are all really good tips. And in terms of, of allocating your, your actual portfolio. And the next question I'd love to ask you, and also talking about coins and tokens, since we're talking about value, Leah, if you could tell me what are your favorite projects at the moment, that would be absolutely amazing. Obviously, as you said, it's better to have, you know, a few coins and tokens rather than having too many and impossible to manage them. But what are some of the projects that really mean a lot to you? Yeah, I mean, so there's some, um, you know, tokens that I've invested in, you know, like just because they're like the main players. And so they actually have a lot of development. And so, you know, I actually do really like um, Depost chains. And so I have, um, you know, been really interested in watching the whole progression of EOS and EOSIO and Telos and just kind of like watching all of that. Um, obviously, Ethereum is like such a solid choice in terms of just looking at everything that's being built there as well. Um, I really like Monero. Um, I have been getting more into privacy coins and researching them and having people on my channel to talk about privacy coins. And so I'm a big advocate for, for Monero as kind of like the OG privacy coin. Um, but in terms of like just other projects, I really, really like to focus on things that make crypto adoption easier for everyday consumers. And so whether that's a wallet that has a really good experience, um, like I really like Edge and Shapeshift, um, you know, as, as wallets that kind of make that user experience feel a little bit smoother. Um, but also like I'm actually just a huge fan of things like where people can earn Bitcoin without having to even go through the whole process of what's an exchange? What's this thing called KYC? How do I do this, 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 and this? And so I'm a big fan of Lolly um, just because I think that's like the easiest way for people to get their first little bits of Bitcoin. And I think that like that's so important because I know with my own story of how I got into crypto, I actually started blogging on um, a, a platform called Steemit like three years ago and started earning crypto. And that's what really caused me to become more interested and ask more of those questions because I actually had some crypto in my hand. So then I had to say like, okay, why is this worth anything? What do I do with it? You know, like it just kind of yeah. led down the whole rabbit hole. And so I think that making the first entry point for people to get their first bits of Bitcoin or crypto is actually really powerful. 
It is so powerful because, you know, like you said, you do not necessarily need money. You can actually take actions, be a part of different DAOs, right, and earn the crypto. So uh, mm-hmm. that's really a really good point. And you just mentioned that Monero and a lot of people, the hardcore Monero privacy or however, however you want to call them. Actually, there are plenty here in London. They say that it's the only coin to really be 100% private. And uh, there's a funny story that I want to share with you, Leo, which is, uh, which is something, it's a bit controversial, but it's fun. Uh, a lot of the guys <laughs> that I know here in London who like to smoke weed, <laughs> they, t- they tell me that Monero has replaced Bitcoin as a default option, you know, for buying their own things. Of course, they're good people, right? They just like to have a little bit of fun. But what are the use cases for Monero in terms of privacy coins? Mm. Why do you think we still need it, even if we have, you know, the Lightning Network for Bitcoin for s- semi-private transactions, for instance? Well, I think that that's the key right there, what you just said, semi-private. And so I think that, I mean, Bitcoin is pretty pseudo-anonymous. And so there's definitely certain levels of anonymity within that. But, you know, one of my favorite quotes about privacy that I I think really sums up my whole perspective on this is uh, one by Edward Snowden, where he talks about how, you know, saying that you don't need privacy because you have nothing to hide is saying that is the same thing as saying that you don't care about free speech because you have nothing to say. And so I think that this whole premise that um, privacy and anonymity equals some sort of crime or some sort of bad behavior, I, I think is absolutely untrue. And so when we're looking at, you know, kind of bringing it back to my kind of world philosophy in the way that I approach things, I think privacy coins actually line up really, really well with that. You know, with people having choice, having the choice of what kind of information they want out in the world, what kind of information they want to um, be able, you know, others to see. And it is possible if you're really intentional to, you know, make your Bitcoin transactions even more anonymous. Like you can make sure to never give the same address twice. You can mix things like there's some steps you can take. Um, But I, I, I do think that just as a whole, the value proposition of Monero is probably only going to get stronger as the government b- becomes more involved in the crypto industry and wanting to regulate it. I think that we're going to see more of a move to privacy coins. That is awesome. And, that's, and, and I can feel the passion that you have for privacy coins, even though we're <laughs> separated through this uh, technology. But are there any other things like topics this year that you feel are really exciting and some things that you're looking forward to? And also, I'd love to ask you, because this show is called Kryptonites which is, you know, like the mm-hmm. kryptonite of Superman. So like, what is the biggest, you know, challenge as well for us to actually uh, reach the goals and, and what we're supposed to achieve? It's a big question. Yeah. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, it, it is interesting. I feel like everyone's talking about DeFi yeah. as like the big topic for this year. And I do think that's important. Um, but I, I really like to focus on like, what is making adoption easier and how do we make crypto feel more approachable and so you've mentioned you know a few times that i have you know the educational content but i also have some kind of lighthearted, fun content and that's very intentional because i think that when people come to the crypto space and if they aren't super techie nerdy like i'm not like super techie if i came to that and everything seemed just really like over my head i would lose interest so fast where if i come to the crypto space and i see people that are making more lifestyle content that are having fun you know there's memes there's different things going on like i actually think that is really valuable for making the space feel more approachable and so um so that's something that i i think is is really important and i I think we're starting to see more of a shift where more creators are are starting to make content that kind of is along those same lines, and that makes me really excited and happy and happy to see that. Um, so I guess that would be like just kind of a topic that I'm interested in continuing to pursue is creating more lifestyle content around Bitcoin that makes it more approachable. And then for the the kryptonite for the um, you know, what we could improve, you know, I do think that just awareness is, is really key. Like, I think that we get in our little echo chamber here on crypto Twitter, (laughs) where (laughs) we think the whole world revolves around us and that everyone, (laughs) you know, (laughs) knows about Bitcoin. But, you know, I definitely think that, you know, kind of along the same lines of, you know, um, making the space feel more approachable, I think meeting consumers where they're at is really important too. And so how can we be, as a space, making content on other platforms 
that is reaching new audiences instead of just kind of waiting for everyone to come to us on crypto Twitter, right? And so that's kind of why I'm pretty passionate about making content on other platforms like Instagram, like even Pinterest. And, you know, I hate to say TikTok, but, um, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I'm there as well. Um, because I think that putting this content in front of them where they're already hanging out is, is a really valuable thing versus just saying, oh, hey, we're on YouTube and Twitter. You can come check us out here. And so I think that um, that's something I'm really excited about working on as well. And I think that as an just as an industry as a whole, that's not something we're necessarily doing a lot of, but we are starting to see more of a trend in that direction. That's so true. You know, the memes and all these fun videos, literally when you look at the amount of views and hits they get, right? It's incredible, <laughs> right? It's something that a lot mm -hmm. of people take lightly, but you know, a little bit of fun it definitely. And, and I, I really, I really am so proud to have, you know, like women ambassadors, power women like yourself and we had crypto finally as well the other day. We're pushing stuff that's a bit lighter and a bit more fun than the boring stuff that, that I us guys make. <laughs> <laughs> Well, and the funny thing is too, you know, because I obviously I, I make educational content as well. I do interviews on my channel, um, you know, to different explainer and tutorial videos. You you just mentioned views, and it is really funny how people sometimes they get like a little bit of heat for making more of the lifestyle content. They're like, you know, come on, just focus on the education. I'm like, yeah, but that that post got like 22 likes, and this like lifestyle one got four or five hundred. So I think it's kind of showing a little bit what the consumer is looking for as well and what they're interested in consuming. So I think they're all very important and they all play um, a different role in the ecosystem. But I, I definitely do think that, you know, it is it is important and it's becoming more um, more apparent that that's the case. If you don't mind, Leah, I would love to put your Harry Potter video actually in this video, like embedded just for people to see, give it, have an example of what fun content looks like. <laughs> yeah, if you want to take a, a little clip from it, go for it. <laughs> I would love to, yeah. And so, uh, Leah, tell me, tell us a little bit about people who do not know you yet and want to follow you. Uh, I know you're active on Twitter, um, and you also have uh, videos on YouTube, like Girl Gone Crypto, which is pretty easy to find. But anything else that you'd like to share with our community? Uh, just thank you so much for having me on the show. It's been really great to get to chat with you and you know get to meet your community a little bit more. I'm excited to you know catch on the comments um, on this video and get to know people. Um, but yeah, I definitely say that um, YouTube and Twitter are kind of my main platforms. But you know you can also find me on Instagram, LinkedIn. Um, Facebook, TikTok, like I, I'm pretty much wherever people hang out online, uh, you can probably find me. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you so much, Leah. And guys, don't forget to follow Leah on Twitter. We'll have the links in the description below. Don't forget to tune in every Wednesday premiering at 8 o'clock BST at a PC near you. See you next week, guys.